The following presentation of Cinema Then, Cinema Now is made possible in part by the collaboration of Casa de España of New York, the Consulate General of Spain of New York, and the Spain 92 Foundation. <laughs> Welcome to Cinema Then, Cinema Now, the film series with lively discussion. I'm your host, Jerry Carlson, and I teach cinema studies at the College of Staten Island of the City University of New York. Today we continue our series surveying some of the accomplishments of Spanish film during the Franco period. Spanish film under Franco. We'll be seeing today one of the early films of Carlos Sara, perhaps Spain's best known filmmaker. It's from 1965, and it's titled The Hunt. Like many films made during this period, it has a strongly allegorical aspect, as well as having an exciting surface texture itself. We'll be talking about those issues and several others after today's screening. It's a pleasure to have as our guest today, Professor Carolyn Richman of Brooklyn College of the City University of New York, and Professor Kathleen Vernon of the State University of New York at Stony Brook. Enjoy the hunt. A discussion. Hi. Welcome back to Cinema Then, Cinema Now. I hope you enjoyed the opportunity to see a Carlos Sara's The Hunt, La Casa, or La Caza, as I'm told uh, it would be pronounced in, in, pronounced in uh, Castilian. There's a lot to talk about about this film, so let me take this moment to introduce uh, today's two guests, and then we'll get going on this. To my left, it's a pleasure to have a colleague from the City University of New York, uh, Professor Carolyn Richman from uh, Brooklyn College. Carolyn's a specialist in 19th and 20th century uh, Spanish uh, narrative. She's currently actually doing a lot of work on the effect, the opposite effect, the effect that cinema had upon Spanish literary uh, culture, particularly in the, among the avant-garde artists of the 20s, but it doesn't stop her from talking about Carlos Sara. Right. right. Over to my right, uh, it's a pleasure to have back on the show Professor Kathleen Vernon. Uh, Katie teaches at uh, SUNY Stony Brook, uh, where uh, she's a specialist in a 19th and 20th century Spanish and Latin American uh, literature and uh, does a lot of work on uh, Spanish and Latin American film. In addition, she's uh, edited a um, collection of essays about the arts, relationship between the arts and the Spanish uh, Civil War. Katie, the Spanish Civil War is going to make its way into our discussion eventually, but there was a, if not a war, at least a little battle within the culture industry of Spain uh, that preceded the making of this film by a couple of years. And that's something we talked a bit about a couple of weeks ago, but it's well worth rehearsing a little bit. And that's the, the scandal surrounding uh, Buñuel's Viridiana. What was that scandal, just briefly, and what kind of effect did it have upon somebody like Sara and upon this film? Really, in some sense, much of the, many of the films of the 60s and 70s, some of which you're going to be seeing in the series, um, the current series, in some way their, their existence is due, ironically, to the scandal that erupted around the, the showing of Viridiana. Buñuel, who had left Spain, um, at, at the end of the Spanish Civil War was invited back. He had never, as many Spanish exiles following the war, he had never set foot in Spain. He was invited back to, to make a film. That film was Viridiana, and it went through all the usual channels of censorship. The, the screenplay was submitted to the censors. It was passed. They insisted upon a few changes, but 
they were able to proceed. Um, the final version of the film before it showing at the Cannes Film Festival was cut in, in France, so they were not able to see, the officials were not able to see a final version. It then won, of course, the, the main prize at the Cannes Film Festival, uh, to the great delight of, of Spanish officials, since they really felt that, that uh, well, promoting this kind of, you know, respectable artistic film was a way to improve Spain's Own standing image, yes. abroad. So they were delighted until uh, the day following the awarding of the prize, the, the Vatican newspaper came out with a ringing editorial against the film, denouncing it as scandalous, obscene, um, you know, anti-religious. And that brought crashing down the kind of piece together, you know, right. film industry for making serious films in Spain. Um, the independent producers who had participated in it, among Bardem and Berlanga, major figures were involved right. in this independent producer. Their film company was dissolved. And so during the early years of the 60s, there was sort of a vacuum. Um, then in 62, there was a change of government. A new minister of, of, of information and tourism was brought in, Fraga Ibarne, who continues today to be a member of the, the opposition government, the conservative opposition to the current socialist government. But at that time, he passed as almost a flaming liberal. Right, right. right. And uh, he brought in a new director of cinematography, who then set out to promote, um, essentially, um, Films in the in the the line of Biridiana, films made by this time up and coming Spanish film directors like Sauda, and they sort of instituted a kind of two track censorship that would allow for films of the nature of The Hunt, which I'm sure we'll get into, right. um, to be made with an idea that they would th their main audience in some sense would be would be an, a foreign audience in foreign film festivals. It was this and, and this, this is all part of this, this is all operation. part of the strategy of reshaping the image of Franco Spain mm -hmm. as a place of a significant kind of culture right. of a, a kind of tolerance and also uh, I, I take it also a way of folding them into the image of being just another European country because of course the early 60s is a period in which the art cinema is flourishing mm -hmm. uh, across Europe mm -hmm. and is crossing the Atlantic. Mm -hmm. Everybody is, dis is I mean, uh, uh, Fellini, Antonioni, the French New Wave, mm -hmm. uh, etc. So this is a way of saying, oh gee guys, we're just one of you. Exactly, exactly. Okay, Th that sort of brings us over to the nature of the society itself at this time. You were telling me before the show, uh, Carolyn, that you actually were doing some research uh, in Madrid at this time in the, in the mid-60s. It's very interesting. Were you aware of, of this kind of thing going on in cinema uh, or uh, at, at the time, or were you and your friends, or were there other things that were more or less on the mind of madrileños and of other Spaniards at the time? I was part of a, a large uh, contingent of Fulbrighters uh, and spent a year there doing research and getting to know Spain. Uh, I think what was most on our minds as Americans was just the experience of living in Spain, which was so terribly different from anything we'd been through in the United States. Uh, it was very repressive and oppressive for us. Uh, the streets were filled with uh, very polite policemen. Um, but filled with them. But filled with them. For that reason, it was very safe. There were still gypsies wandering the streets. The, there was a lot of poverty. Um, women could not wear pants. There was a lot of censorship. I went and asked for uh, a novel, La Regenta, uh, something I've studied, uh, done a lot of work on. I asked for it in a bookstore and was told that that was prohibited. You couldn't buy a book like that. There were all kinds of books that were still censored. It was an oppressive time, and none of us uh, were aware that I know it of, um, of what was going on in the cinema. Maybe this was done for export, but we certainly didn't talk about that. We, we talked about uh, Spanish society and how different it was and, and uh, what it was like living in a dictatorship. Right. Uh what sense did you have uh, of what was going on in the literature at the time, as opposed to, say, the, the, the cinema? I mean, uh, were there things similar uh, going on in literature to what we'll be soon chatting about is going on in this, uh, in yeah. this film? Well, uh, in 1955, an important book uh, was, a novel was published called El Jarama, 
But in English, that would be? El Jarama. The Jarama is the name of a river. Okay. Uh, and it was by Sanchez Ferlosio. And that book, uh, practically nothing takes place. This is a, a period of realism, neorealism in Spanish literature. Practically nothing takes place. Uh, a group of young people um, on a Sunday, I think it's a Sunday, go for a picnic uh, next to the Jarama River, and there is uh, a, this is already beginning to sound familiar, by the way. Yes, and it, <laughs> and, it, and at the end there is a an act of, of uh, violence, which is not expected, and nothing else happens. And the Harama, of course, for readers of the time, meant a great deal because that was one of the big battle sites of the Spanish Civil War. So we already have a an important novel that takes place in a battleground. Right. And then there's, a, in 62, uh, Miguel de Libes, who has indeed been published, uh, in, uh, translated into English, uh, in, published something called La Ratas, The Rats. And it was a, a painful small novel in which uh, the main characters lived by hunting rats, which were eaten. Uh, a something that comes up very specifically. <laughs> That's why I'm in, mentioning right, it. Right, exactly. That's why I'm mentioning it. Uh, then, uh, if we skip to uh, 10 years after um, the Saura movie that uh, we're going to be uh, c talking about, we have some, another novel by uh, De Libes called Las Guerras de Nuestros Antipasados, The Wars of Our Ancestors, which treats uh, the Civil War already. It's written in the 70s, but we're talking about uh, Wars, uh, human nature is people, brothers against brothers, uh, town people, towns divided, generations divided, um, families, generations having fought in different wars, uh, people not being able to get along together. Um, the symbolism is quite obvious. So that this, uh, these themes can be traced in literature. Right, so we were talking about an entire, uh, if we wanted to, um, in one sense, just uh, put them together for a second, an entire narrative context, that mm -hmm. this is not just a tradition that's developing in cinema, whatever those specific conditions may be, but it's a, a tradition uh, developing um, uh, across uh, narrative forms as well. There is a great concern for the Civil War, and uh, it will, it is manifest uh, at this time in, in literature and film, and uh, undoubtedly in all the arts. Okay. Well, Katie, let's get, uh, let's get more specific on, <laughs> uh, 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 on this, having done some of the contextual stuff. In what ways do you find the traces uh, of the Civil War in this film, The Hunt, and why is the Civil War important for our understanding of what's happening mm -hmm. uh, in this film? Because in one sense, not a lot happens in this film mm -hmm. until the last five or, ten, mm -hmm. five or ten minutes. It's just a bunch of guys out hunting, mm -hmm. chatting. Mm -hmm. What about the Spanish Civil War? And, and mm -hmm. How important is it we understand the Civil War to understand this film? Mm -hmm. Well, as Carolyn was saying, I mean, it's uh, in many ways it's very parallel to El Jarama. Here's a, a, a movie really where very little happens, um, but and really the 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 political, if you will, message is communicated more by means of what is not said than by means of what is said directly. Um, again, this situating um, the story of a hunting party in a context uh, in in the physical locale of a former battleground. Right. Um, so that the, the hunt for rabbits, as it's mentioned in the di dialogue, becomes a metaphor or an allegory of the hunt for men, right, of, of the war. Uh, let, let me just interrupt you for a second, uh, uh, because I think there's some things, uh, without being too specific, that are a little bit ambiguous uh, in the subtitles the, themselves. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Which side were these guys on, and, these, and what are the indications yeah. in the film of that? The indications for a Spanish audience in particular um, that are that they belong to the generations of the victors, of the nationalists, of the supporters of Franco, right, right. who had won the Civil War. In fact, the impact of showing, of treating um, the lives of the victors whose right. lives are, are shown to be, to be empty, full of hypocrisy, alcoholism, adultery, divorce, 
all the kind of, of moral failings that the, the Francoist revolution or rebellion claimed to have sa rescued Spain from. I mean, Spain as the moral refuge of the, of the West, right. um, the crusade to save Spain and save Christianity from the atheistic communists. Um, I mean, all of, that, all of that rhetoric, Francoist rhetoric, lies behind the treatment of, in fact, the, the, the very people who fought for these supposed ideals show that their lives do not reflect those ideals in, in the least possible way. In a, um, but um, the war, the the war's presence is it's 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 one of the. I mean, they're the subtitles in some ways fill in some of the ambiguities. Okay. Um, in Saura and Kerejeta, the producer of the film, recount that when they submitted the film to the censors, uh, submitted the script to the right. censors, that was part of the the censorship conditions. Um, from the end of the war in 39 through 1976, right after the death of Franco, that all films were subject to prior censorship Ship. of script. Um, so they were forced to remove any specific references to the Civil War. All the references in the dialogue, the actual Spanish dialogue of the film, talk about the war. Um, okay. And it's, I mean, the, this is played upon in, in the moment when they're talking about the war and the caves and, you know, the killings that went on there. And the younger uh, man, the Enrique, uh, right. who's the brother-in-law of one of the, one of the three hunters, uh, older hunters who are right. veterans Paco, of the I war, so. yeah. um, says, what war? As, <laughs> if, as if he doesn't know. And they, never, they don't even feel the need to explain what war. It's clear to a Spanish audience what war is being talked about. Um, but nevertheless, I think, I think the film gains in power through that sort of prohibition of ever saying what war, whose side. Um, even the title of the film, apparently, in the original script, they had wanted to title it The Rabbit Hunt. Um, and the censors insisted that they cut rabbit because it was too sexually suggestive. Um, nevertheless, it, it, they, I mean, it seems to be a case where, ironically, the censors collaborated in some in, in, sense. In, in, in drawing the yeah. attention to mm -hmm. it, making it a more explicitly mm -hmm. allegorical mm -hmm. kind, yeah. kind, yeah. kind of text. What, what uh, Katie was saying about what they don't say uh, brings up a, 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 an issue we had also been chatting a little bit about um, before the show, and that is, this is a film with, I think, a very interesting soundtrack in the full sense of the, the three components of sound in film, of the music, the dialogue, and the sound effects themselves. And the silence. Okay. You know, Tell me about the silence. There's this, I think the soundtrack is, is wonderful, very appropriate, because um, one can read the film uh, on one level as I think the anonymity, the ambiguities of the, of the film uh, suggest a reading, um, an allegorical reading as uh, four soldiers. They, they, they have a jeep that looks like a... Right. Um, that reminds you of a military, military vehicle. Jeep. They themselves uh, with their guns, and many of which came from the war, um, um, Including the Look, Luger with yes, the German the Luger. and fascist identification. Exactly. Um, they, they remind us of soldiers. There are a number of um, times in the film when they say, this isn't a military crusade or whatever. There are a lot of times that they remind you of hunters, soldiers themselves out there. The, when I talk about silence, what interests me, of course, is the use of drums. Mm -hmm. um, okay. That Luis de Pablo has put in the drum music, and then uh, with a little piano overtone. Then when they load that wonderful scene when they load the uh, the guns, which is it's uh, very powerful, and we hear nothing but the loading of the guns. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, then the time when we have the crickets, when there's just crickets in the background, and then the killing of the cricket. Yes. Um, and the shooting of the cricket. The and then there are times when there's just silence. So I think the silence is as, is as, um, is, is uh, powerful as the sounds themselves or the speaking. And essentially the silence is, much of the movie is about silence. It's about secrets that, that everyone right. knows about. Mm -hmm. But it's, 
I mean, it's a bad joke to talk about the skeleton in the closet, but the skeleton, well, it's there. the <laughs> skeleton in the cave is not buried. They don't bury that skeleton on purpose, and everybody knows it's there, but it's a secret. Mm -hmm. And there are lots of secrets. There's a secret about Maribel. There's a secret about Arturo. And there are all kinds of secrets that are shared by those three. But the interesting thing, getting back to Enrique, is that Enrique doesn't share. He doesn't know. He can't know. So his generation doesn't mm -hmm. know mm -hmm. right. about the war. Mm -hmm. And he can ask that question, mm -hmm. uh, which I think is, is, it is a war. It is a film about generations. The old woman, then these, uh, these quote, brothers who, mm -hmm. who end up killing themselves, killing each other, sorry. Then you have Enrique, mm -hmm. and then you have the very, the young girl mm -hmm. yes. who is, who is and represents another generation full of curiosity, full of a desire to live, mm -hmm. full of a, wants to know everything. Mm -hmm. So you, whatever happens is eventually those, the people of that generation are going to die and the new, younger generations are going to mm -hmm. take, mm -hmm. it, take mm -hmm. over. That young girl is interesting just for oh. a second because uh, though she doesn't, she doesn't have such a large role, there's a way in which her uncle, um, uh, we see him as wounded and, and crippled. Mm -hmm. And I take, uh, I, I simply read that, that he's one of the, uh, following from what Katie was saying, he's one of the losers. He's both the class that lost mm -hmm. uh, and also, I mean, quite literally, it, it, sure, it could have been a hunting accident or something like that, but we would also read that he would be of an age that he might have been indeed crippled yeah. in the war. She's she's unaware, just as Enrique mm -hmm. is of this. They twist together mm -hmm. out there yeah. um, on the high yeah, plane. Yeah, they do. Uh, it, I think that's the hope in the film. Uh, the first time I saw the film, I didn't read it this way, but the second time I saw the ending quite differently. Um, I think the hope is, if, if you look at the entire action as a, a weak low, a no exit, a, 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 a sejourn in hell, in which they really are in hell, and all the all the repressed violence mm -hmm. that Katie was talking about—that violence that is stopped, the fire, for example, that's put out, the several fights that they have, then they make up, that finally erupts into this self, complete self-destruction. Uh, what do we get out of that? All of a sudden, it, we see that that took place way down there. Mm -hmm. right. Not quite in the holes, because that's even worse, the, 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 the function of the holes. It took that place down there, and Enrique climbs out. He's coming out from the hill right. into, uh, mm -hmm. to, to, to get away and to spread the news, but it is a coming forward. And I think that's the hope of the younger generation, simply because they weren't involved. Mm -hmm. At the end of the dead end, or at least the promise of the end mm -hmm. of the but dead end. Yes, and it, and it is a hopeful ending because you see him climbing out and then his young face there on the screen frozen so that that is left behind down there. Yeah. Let, let's talk for a minute about how we get from beginning uh, to end in this because this is a film uh, in which you, as we've said before, at least I sort of not a lot happens in some traditional uh, mm -hmm. dramatic senses. Though by the end of the film, I think we all have a notion that it's an extremely tightly structured mm -hmm. um, a, a piece. What do you, Katie? What do you read as some of the principles of exposition and progression? Mm -hmm. How does this film end up being that tightly uh, mm -hmm. structured, and why? Mm -hmm. Why well, structured in this way? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, Carolyn has mentioned the, the importance of the closed space. I mean, this is a film with a tremendous, you know, classical unity of, of time and space. It takes place, with the exception of the little exposition in the bar, where we find out a little bit about the background of, the, of each of the characters. Um, it takes place in a, in, a, in a single place over the course of a hunting party, you know, over the, the you know, principal hours right. of a single day. Um, and from the very beginning, the link is made between hunting for rabbits and, and hunting for, for human beings. I mean, Luis has, has alluded to that. Um, but there are, there are other kinds of, of lines of argument, I think, right. uh, presented in, in images, in dialogue. Um, the kind of chain of of, I guess you, you'd say, natural chain of beings. I mean, these sort of links between insects, um, crickets, to rabbits, to ferrets, right. to, 
uh, to human beings, men and women. But it's a it's a chain of being, you know, in a very in a very violent sense of the preyed upon and the 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 animals of it, prey. I, I think that's a really interesting uh, a point because these are uh, I would just men really of the city, mm -hmm. and we are seeing them. Uh, in, th in this paradox, we're seeing them when they're in one of their, we take it relatively rare, mm -hmm. direct encounters mm -hmm. with, even though it is Don Jose's land, with the land mm -hmm. and with nature. Mm -hmm. And yet at the same time, there's, there's a, 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 a paradoxical sense about that because there's a great sense, as, as Carolyn pointed out, of enclosure even though we're outside. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't have um, uh, the sense of this being endless or something yeah. like that. I'm, uh, I, I have a sense of entrapment it, as well. It's certainly not, not a pastoral vision of right. nature. You know? right. It's not a vision of, of, of natural man or woman as, you know, as, as the idealized natural savage or, or any of that. I mean, nature becomes a place where all the, all the trappings of you know, 60s modernized Spain you know, 60s right. are the year of the of, are the years of the economic miracle in Spain. The influx of tourists. I mean, all of that is very present on the soundtrack. I think yes, it's the yes. place where where that comes in. Um, on one hand, you have you have men in the hunting party. You know, sort of an an, an a mythic kind of vision of, of masculine existence. Man, the hunter. Um, on the other hand, you have these intrusions of modernity and civilization through the music and, and the, the, its, its instruments, the radio, the jeep, things like that. Um, but nature seems to bring out um, the, most, the most primitive side of these, of these businessmen, technocrats, again, their identification with what has become of the, the generation of victors of the Spanish Civil well, that, War. That brings up a, a sort of interesting uh, question to me about the film, and that is, why are they there? Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, uh, they've arrived for, um, for a hunt, mm -hmm. um, and yet uh, they don't seem to have done it that frequently. Mm -hmm. uh, it's been a number of years since they've, since they've been there. Uh, one would think, oh, it's just a social occasion. But then as the uh, exposition of the film continues, we learn more and more that there's a set of issues involved with them mm -hmm. that are not merely recreational. And uh, they have a profound need to uh, reaffirm their machismo through this hunt, but that's not how they're going to end up doing it in this, mm -hmm. uh, in, in this film at all. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, we, we know in terms of the conversation that that uh, Jose has invited his old friend Paco to go right. on this hunt in order to hit him up for some money to save yeah. his business. And that Paco, in fact, has been aware all along that he's going to be hit up. And yet he's come along, <laughs> nevertheless. Um, uh, so it's, it's uh, you know, I mean, it's, well, there, it's there's not... There's this tangle. I mean, they're, they're, there's this, they're drawn to each other in a magnetic kind of way, mm -hmm. and yet the way in which you turn magnets around and they repel each other mm -hmm. uh, works as well. Carolyn, you were... Yes, there's a fatal attraction there. They can't stay away from each other. They know too much. There are many, many un unexplained things that they know, and that's important because they're not explained to Enrique either. Mm -hmm. Enrique really is the observer, in mm -hmm. a sense. And he's the spectator. He's the spectator, exactly. He, 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 is our, he stands in for us. We're mm -hmm. watching it with Enrique. And that's his role coming at the end. Uh, when he comes out, he's coming out to us. And he, so we are seeing it through him. And, and we don't know what's going on between them, really what's going on. It's sorted, obviously, it, it, whatever a, it is. Well, the, one, is. Of the thing, one of the ways the film emphasizes that, that I find, uh, I, I think a spectator may not expect from the first 10 minutes or so of the film is the way in which this film relies upon multiple in interior monologues. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, that at a certain point we think maybe, oh, maybe it's just going to be Enrique because he's the one who singled out uh, as I remember yeah. first, and mm -hmm. so yeah. he's the outsider. But then we shift and go into uh, thoughts yeah. of, uh, of any number mm -hmm. uh, of them. Yes, it's a, there is no real protagonist. There, it's, it's the group. It's the generation. Uh, there is, and and they're very. Um, they are. It's a web of interior monologues. Right, absolutely. And it's done very artistically. Just as the when the, the they separate into two pairs, uh, it's it's all done with a great deal of harmony. Um, but it it again it gives us a sense that there is no uh, 
or it, it, it reinforces the sense of no protagonist. It's the group and the interdependence and all those secrets that they have that they all know mm -hmm. that somehow they went, after all, we, if, if that film, if it were seen, we have to remember who right. the viewers were. The viewers of that generation would, would really read that film. We are reading it, uh, all, we, we see it with some historical right. knowledge, whereas young people, if they saw the, young Spaniards, if young Spaniards at that time saw the film, they would probably look at it the way Enrique does. Mm -hmm. Right, a very, a, yeah. a, a, a very good. It's mm -hmm. very important, the context. Now, if it were seen by people outside of Spain uh, who knew about Spain, it would be read perhaps more allegorically. But in any case, there is, I find that just the physical types of those three men makes it difficult on first viewing to distinguish between them. You really have to uh, separate them mm -hmm. out, particularly if you see it on a small screen, which oh, yes, doesn't yes. allow you. Yeah. But they are somehow meant to be very similar. As a, well, as they're not. Similar, but, yeah, but I mean, for a Spanish audience, again, if we go yeah. back to the context, I mean, one of the things that we, that I had mentioned before in our conversation right. is one of the actors, I mean, they were all mm. well-known actors, but one, Alfredo Mayo, who plays the role of Paco, um, was well-known to Spanish audiences at the time because he was the, the prime leading man of the, the films of the 40s and 50s, who, which promoted the Francoist ideology. Um, Mayo had played the traditional heroic soldier, po fighter pilot, as a matter of fact, in a film that was based on a screenplay written by Franco himself, Franco himself. Mm -hmm. called Race, right. Raza. He played the role of the kind of idealized version of Franco himself, um, a foot and a half taller and with a good deal deeper voice. But so this identification this with being the, the voice of Francoism in film, to see that turned around in this film. And he is the one who actually says, I look terrible mm -hmm. when he's looking mm -hmm. I, I, looking in the mirror. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm going to have to uh, say that I think he may look terrible in that shot, but the film looks very, very good mm -hmm. to us, and we've run out of time at this particular moment mm -hmm. for uh, further discussion about it. If you'd like uh, further information about cinema then, cinema now, or about cinema studies, drop us a line. Drop it to cinema then, cinema now, the College of Staten Island, Staten Island, New York, 10301. Let me give you that information again, okay? Drop it to Cinema Then, Cinema Now, the College of Staten Island, Staten Island, New York, 10301. Carolyn, thanks for joining us and bringing your expertise about Spanish literature, society, cinema, etc. Pleasure having you here. Katie, same goes for you about that expertise, the literature, the society, uh, the cinema, and all that. Pleasure having you and look forward to having you back as always. Thank you. Okay. I hope that our thought and discussion here, in any case, leads you to thought and discussion at home that you enjoy. Thanks for joining us. And yet again, 